Hello and welcome to module 8, uh, Children and Human Rights. Uh, the most important aspect in uh, child protection is the Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, of uh, 1989. Uh, it is the guiding principle in child protection around the world. So, in fact, virtually all countries recognize it, with the exception of uh, Somalia and the United States, uh, when I last checked. Uh, it has four core principles. One is no child should be discriminated. So all children, irrespective of gender, irrespective of race, class, ethnicity, and so forth, uh, should be treated the same. The next point is the devotion of the best interest of the child so that whenever the decisions have to be made in regard to a child, uh, this principle of best interest has to be the guiding principle. Uh, the third one is the right to life, survival and development of the child. And lastly, the respect of the views of the child uh, where the child is able to express those views. Uh, a good example of uh, the work that needs to be done is uh, looking at the health needs. Uh, if you are looking at the health, health needs of the child, uh, Article 24 uh, can provide some guidance there. And uh, it says that uh, state parties recognize the right of the child to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health and to facilities for the treatment of illness and rehabilitation of health. State parties shall strive to ensure that no child is deprived of his or her right of access to such health care services. So states are implored to provide the best possible health services uh, for children. Uh, best interest is an important uh, principle and it's good to spend a little bit of time looking at this. Uh, it's the most powerful, but also in other ways, the most controversial aspect of uh, uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Why is it so? Uh, because it's not always easy to establish uh, the best interest of the child. Uh, there are many uh, you know, competing uh, interpretations of the best interest of the child. And also parents always ask, you know, what, you know, uh, what about the family? What about the, the interest of the, the parent who has given birth to this child? Uh, what about the best interest of uh, you know, the family unit? Is that taken into, into consideration? And obviously, you get the fathers too. Sometimes, when um, the child is being handed over to the to the mother, the the father will be asking, you know, what about the the, the interest of the the father? Why, why is that not being taken into consideration? So, it looks very easy and straightforward. Best interest of the child but it is also controversial. But that is what we have, that's what uh, you know, the world has agreed on and it remains the guiding principle. Uh, and it is stated that uh, in all actions concerning children, whether undertaken by public or private social welfare institutions, courts of law, administrative authorities or registrative bodies, the best interests of the child shall be a primary consideration. And of course, when it says it's a primary consideration, it doesn't say it's the only consideration, but it, if push comes to shove, that has to be the one. In New South Wales, there is um, an aspect that is also very important, uh, the one that is referred to as significant harm, 
Uh, so for the child to be removed, uh, it not only the, the, you don't only have to establish that uh, the child is at risk of being harmed, uh, but that there is a significant uh, there is a risk of significant harm. Uh, it can be argued that uh, you know that doesn't necessarily uh, work in the best interest of the child, uh, but that is a registration that uh, we have to work with. And I think that um, why that was uh, introduced, uh, the idea of signi significant harm, is that uh, the uh, the services were being overwhelmed with cases, so to try and prioritize the ones that are at the highest risk, they introduce this principle of uh, significant harm. Uh, there are also significant differences uh, between states. Each state has its own uh, child protection principles, uh, different emphasis, and you know, it would be good if it was all the same, but uh, unfortunately, uh, states have not been able to establish um, a one uh, uniform approach to the child protection issues. So while definitions vary, the thresholds for statutory intervention are broadly consistent. Uh, you have to prove that the child is at risk of harm. That said, there is some variation as to the threshold at which statutory services can intervene. Uh, for example, whether intervention is triggered as a result of harm, uh, as a, a place like Victoria, or serious or significant harm, as the case of New South Wales. There is also variations across jurisdictions regarding whether it's abuse or neglect for actions or consequences or a combination of the two that are substantiated. So going back to that uh, significant harm and best interest issue, uh, the, in the New, New South Wales uh, Children and Young Persons Act of 1998 states that I introduced the significant harm principle as a threshold that justifies compulsory intervention in family life in the best interests of children. Uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, and neglect are all categories of uh, significant harm. And it's challenging work. I think we need to acknowledge that. Uh, social workers or in that particular role of uh, child protection workers have to make these decisions. Uh, often it's hard and it does require a teamwork uh, to come up with the, uh, the right decision. And there are cases where, you know, it's uh, damned if you do and damned if you don't uh, because there have been cases where the, you find the workers are blamed uh, for taking the children from their parents, and we have the cases of the you know the stolen generation. But other cases, you have the the workers being blamed uh, for not taking away the child, and that child comes to uh, to harm, even or even killed. Uh, so again, the workers are blamed for not having intervened uh, in a timely way. So it's a very very difficult work. Uh, I have to acknowledge. What also makes it uh, complicated is that there are very many, or there could be very many uh, stakeholders involved. And these are just some uh, examples. Uh, they don't apply to every single case, but you can uh, often have a combination of uh, a number of them. Uh, the child is obviously the, the main one and might or might not be able to express their views depending on their age. Uh, we have the social workers acting as uh, child protection workers. Uh, you have the state represented by the courts uh, or child protection department. 
you have the parents or caregivers uh, you can also have the extended family uh, particularly with the indigenous people uh, the clans can also be involved uh, the grandparents and not men not, not, not forget the, the brothers and sisters uh, other institutions can also have a role that uh, like the school if the child is uh, going to school the police might also be involved uh, you know kindergarten and so on uh, if the child is in foster care then the foster parents could also be involved if the children are in detention uh, you know as refugees the United Nations through UNHCR could also uh, be involved uh, but also uh, other children too the United Nations in an extreme case uh, can also be involved uh, as a, you know as a human rights issue uh, religious institutions uh, they run more, they run a number of um, uh, agencies that uh, look after the welfare of children and they, there could also be religious issues uh, that are that are involved so they could also have a role uh, health workers uh, doctors or nurses and psychologists and so forth uh, if they have been treating the child they could also uh, be part of the stakeholders so you can see it's a whole range of people who might have a view and a say in uh, what's happening with the child uh, there was this uh, very famous report uh, little children are sacred and that's now a few years a few years back uh, in the time of uh, Prime Minister John Howard uh, this report demonstrated that uh, there were some serious abuse issues of children in the Northern Territory and as a result the government instituted uh, the Northern Territory intervention uh, the only problem is they failed to consult uh, the community in fact they didn't even uh, consult the authors of the report adequately, adequately to ascertain what they you know what they uh, what they had found so they just brought you know because there was I think some political expediency they just brought in the army suspended uh, uh, racial discrimination act and really uh, intervened in a very forceful way that uh, even the, the community that was meant to be benefiting from the intervention uh, felt like they were being assaulted rather than assisted so the report had highlighted the pervasive nature of uh, ch child sexual abuse abuse locally uh, as well as nationally and internationally uh, the abuse including physical emotional sexual neglect is related to other wider problems uh, such as poverty drug and alcohol abuse family violence mental illness and homelessness and this really tells you that uh, intervention in child protection or in uh, supporting children is not a simple matter of uh, a, for example just removing the child from uh, a situation where they are you know they are at risk of harm uh, it's a whole range of issues uh, that need to be taken into consideration uh, there, 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 there could be issues that don't just affect the individual family but they, they affect a whole community uh, in some cases could be even a, a whole nation if you are talking of say a, a place like Syria that is you know that uh, that has had a civil war uh, can even call it an international war uh, over such a long period you think about the impact that has on the children and it's not just one family but you know every practically every single child in the country is affected uh, by the, the, the you know the deprivation uh, the trauma of war and so forth
to look at the that northern territory uh intervention it's good to look at it from the uh convention of the rights of the child perspective uh, particularly with respect to article 19 which states that uh, uh, parties shall take all appropriate legislative administrative social and educational measures to protect the child from all forms of physical or mental violence injury <coughs> or abuse neglect or negligent treatment maltreatment or exploitation including sexual abuse while in the care of parents legal guardians or any other person who has care of the child so it can be argued that uh, the government was uh, acting uh, in this spirit uh, however that failure to consult uh, meant that uh, it was ineffective so intervention needs to take all aspects uh, into consideration and think you know uh, why am i intervening what sort of uh, consequences uh, am i expecting uh, we mentioned the the children of asylum seekers uh, mainly because that has been a uh, a major and controversial issue in Australia uh, where you know since probably the 1970s I think uh, the issue of uh, locking up uh, asylum seekers in in detention and these days are uh, uh, offshore as well uh, the issue of uh, locking up children with their, with their, with the parents has been very controversial uh, and it, there, there are no easy solutions because uh, if you take the children away then from the, the parents and leave the children in detention you are also separating the children from uh, their, their families so you are in that sense also uh, breaking some, uh, uh, some of the conventions requirements of keeping the children with the, with the families so if you have to move the children from detention uh, you need to do that uh, with the parents as well uh, but some children are, are unaccompanied or they might be with uh, adults who are not uh, their parents so it is quite complicated but article 22 is the, the one that uh, helps to guide this and and it notes that state parties shall take appropriate measures to ensure that a child who is seeking refugee status or who is considered a refugee in accordance with the applicable international or domestic law and procedures shall whether accompanied or oh sorry whether unaccompanied or accompanied by his or her parents or by any other person receive appropriate protection and humanitarian assistance The argument there then for Australia would be whether when they are locked in they are, they are getting the appropriate humanitarian assistance. Uh, there has been cases where the children have said that uh, the experience of being locked up has been quite traumatic uh, where they have witnessed people having to uh, emulate, you know, self-emulate uh sew up their their lips and the way the guards also treat them can be quite traumatic uh you know so the period of time that they are, they are kept in detention like the the ones in the offshore detention some of them have been there for many years uh so all all that does not seem to be um consistent uh with the with this article now i mentioned before that uh, one of the arguments in the best issue of best interest is the, the rights of uh, parents and in my work uh, with the say for example with the uh, relationship counseling uh, with men 
the I, I was always getting that question where are my right as a father uh, why doesn't uh, the law recognize my rights and I was saying look uh, with the, con the, the, the convention of the rights of the child uh, what is uh, recognized is your responsibility to the child not your right as a, as a parent uh, to own the child that's the way the, the law is. However, it is so it is recognized that the best place for the child is with the family. <clears throat> uh, but that is not because the, the the family has got a right to the children or they own the child, but they have got that responsibility. And the intervention is only when they are not carrying out that responsibility uh, properly. It's a, it's a minefield, I, I know. Uh, but these are some of the guiding principles that have to be taken into consideration. So again here, Article 18 is the guiding one, and it notes that state, state parties shall use their best efforts to ensure recognition of the principle that both parents have common responsibilities for the upbringing and development of the child. Parents, or as the case may be, legal guardians, have the primary responsibility for the upbringing and development of the child. The best interest of the child will be their basic concern. And in this situation when parents who are complaining like that, I would remind them that uh, the government doesn't uh, intervene if the families are carrying out their responsibility uh, appropriately. It's only when they have failed that uh, then the intervention has to take place uh, to protect and uphold the best interests of the child. Uh, I don't think they, they like to hear that, but that's the, the way it is. These days, uh, with the increasing knowledge about the the brain and the role the brain plays in uh, trauma uh, is becoming a, a major focus in uh, child protection. And I think uh, the, that knowledge uh, with some of the leading researchers in this area like uh, Bruce Perry, uh, they have shown that uh, uh, the, 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 the trauma at that early age can be very, very significant uh, to the life of the child. It doesn't mean that it, it, it can't be addressed or the harm cannot be reduced, uh, but it is important the, in, uh, in looking at the welfare of the child to have that understanding of what is happening uh, to, the, to the developing brain of the child. This is a, there is overwhelming evidence that uh, Child abuse is traumatic to children and seriously impairs the growing brain. Bruce Perry and other experts emphasize the importance of nurturing children. And they have shown that uh, uh, being in a nurturing environment can be very important in uh, uh, undoing the harm that is done by the trauma. The social workers play a very important role in child protection. Uh, they are not the only ones uh, by any means, but they are a very significant group. And in some countries, they, they have uh, a much more significant and recognized role, I think, than Australia. Uh, but it's always interesting and important for us, you know, uh, when you are working there as social workers, to always uh, uh, be reflective and always ask ourselves, the, you know, questions like, uh, whose interests are we serving uh, when we are doing the work? Uh, in the interests of our profession, the interests of the employing agency, uh, gender, class, parents, child, uh, self, like, you know, you are in aid for the money. And why this is important is that uh, 
sometimes have come across parents who are not convinced that uh, the social workers, when they are intervening, they are doing it uh, with a with a clean conscience. Uh, by that I mean that they are not just doing it um, in the best interest of the child or the family. They have felt that, uh, for example, uh, talking to African fathers, they have felt that uh, the 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 gender aspect and the ra uh, and the race aspect have made the, the, the workers blind to other issues that are involved uh, with the child or, uh, and therefore they have not taken all issues into consideration. Now that may or may not be the case but it is important for you as the worker to be transparent, uh, to engage, uh, to engage all the, the stakeholders in a in a way that you know you, you listen to all of to all of them, but of course the best interest of the child has to uh, has to be the overriding factor. And I know that uh, you know that is most likely uh, the case, but uh, impressions are also important. So. How do you get it right? Uh, it's important that uh, the intervention has to be appropriate for the situation. Uh, it needs to be done in a timely manner because we talked before of how uh, if you intervene when you shouldn't, then you, you, you know, there'll be problems. If you are late in intervening, there'll be even more problems. So it does need to be timely also needs to be legal and ethical and we can say that you know what happened with the student generation may have been legal but there are questions about whether it was ethical. Uh, balanced uh, in that it is based on the best interests of the child. It needs to be fair to all stakeholders uh, taking take all their, their views and interest into consideration and we have shown how there's uh, a whole range of uh, stakeholders some of them you might not uh, even think about in, in initially but the more you look the more you realize uh, how many there are like uh, you might not think that like for example grandparents or the clan are stakeholders but often they turn out to be and again, you can't assume anything. Uh, it, it should lead to better outcome than uh, the, the present situation. And again, we know many cases where children have been taken uh, from a bad situation to a worse one. Uh, at the very least, it should be uh, it should be leading to a better outcome. Uh, teamwork approach. It's, not, it's hard to overemphasize this because it is so important uh, that the, you know, it is done, the intervention is done by the team because when, whenever you hear people uh, being burnt out in this work, it's when they are trying to make decisions by themselves and not working as a team. It's a huge responsibility to take on your own. But I think uh, that was more in the past. We are moving more and more towards uh, working in teams. Now, there are times when things go really wrong, and <coughs> the the case of Victoria Climb Climby. I don't know how you pronounce that. Uh, it was in the UK. It was an African. Uh, uh, child of migrants there uh, who was uh, very badly treated, very badly neglected, uh, treated like uh, like she had some, um, I know, like a wicked or, you know, some witchcraft sort of uh, issues. And yeah, very badly treated and the child protection people, uh, the doctors, they had seen 
they had seen her, but they they didn't intervene. Uh, and finally, uh, sadly, the, the child died. Uh, when the inquiry was done on the case, uh, they found that it was just a series of um, uh, negligence by all these uh, workers who are supposed to uh, to protect her. So there's a lot that is written. There's also some uh, videos of the case that you can uh, you can see on YouTube. It's a it's a classic case of how things can go terribly, terribly, terribly wrong if we are not observant enough and if we don't take into consideration all the cues that we see. Uh, this, the, the case of Daniel Virario is a, also a classic one. This one was in Australia uh, back in the 90s, around 19... 1992, 93, and and she was killed by the the mother's boyfriend. I think what was happening was that the child was crying, and this uh, stupid boyfriend uh, shook him very, very badly, and, and 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 caused serious injuries. But also, I think there, there was more than just the shaking. I think the shaking is what was emphasized. But uh, if you looked at the, the pictures of the boy, very tiny boy, but was full of uh, bruises. So I think he had actually, I think, yeah, I think, the one, I think he was even throwing him against the wall. He was very, very, very vicious. Uh, yeah, it, again, there's a lot of information about that that you can read. But it is, uh, these two are classic cases of when things go terribly, terribly wrong. I think in the case of uh, Daniel, I think had been seen by the doctors, but again, they they, they missed they missed to uh, to notice the problems. So again, it's good to consider when you are acting, what would be the basis of uh, of of your actions as a social worker? Uh, will it be the social work ethics? Uh, will be the the human rights, acting the best interest of the child, uh, humanism or humanitarian uh, principles. Uh, you'll be acting according to your uh, personal or religious convictions. Uh, will it be political commitment? I think. All these factors are important and they are, they are part of your reflections uh, when you reflect on what you are doing and why you are doing it. So, in conclusion, uh, we can say that the protection of children's human rights is everybody's responsibility. So, while we have a, a particular responsibility as social workers or child protection workers, uh, the responsibilities go beyond that. The, the, the family, the community, uh, the government, and everyone. Uh, respecting the culture of the parents is important, but it's also important to note that culture should not be allowed to be an excuse for failure to protect. Uh, again, how we intervene is also important, and there are various options that uh, are are there in how we plan the intervention. Uh, there can be punitive acts where you punish the, uh, the people for what they have done. Uh, or you can take an, an educational approach uh, where people are trained on, the, on, say, on, uh, on parenting, uh, can provide uh, support, uh, say, if People are not able to do what they what they need to be doing because of uh, significant issues like uh, drug and alcohol use. Uh, people can then be supported uh, to uh, undergo rehabilitation so that they can be able to uh, play their their role as uh, parents. Uh, then the other alternative is community development, where the 
uh, people are not just targeted because they are being bad parents, but the whole community uh, learns uh, and undertakes to provide uh, better support <coughs> and better parenting for the child and not just the ones that have been identified to be uh, a problem. So you can see that uh, long term, uh, this is the, the most effective approach. Uh, there is a role for each one of these uh, approaches, uh, again, depending on the, on the situation. Uh, but it is, it is good to plan with all these, uh, these uh, possible options in mind. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, there are some videos there that, and references that you can look at uh, to inform yourself further about these issues. Thank you very much.